So this is obviously something that the people of Florida voted on, right? So w what is it once again? Okay, so it's to impose a 1% tax, which is going to finance, it says finance pro programs for the homeless. Yeah, they did it. They already did and it. It's done. Right, it's done. Yeah. But my point is, is that it was voted on because when I first started or read about this, I was actually a little bit like, uh, wait a minute, what if I don't want my tax dollars going towards whatever this but well, then you would vote. Part. Exactly. And then, well, that's what I was thinking. So yeah. just to be like, clear, th right. this is a tax that a, a county in my they, the state of Florida, Dade County, Dade right. county in Florida, uh, where all businesses pay into uh, 1%. Wait, it's all restaurants. 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 Oh, restaurants yeah. are getting restaurants taxed. High-end restaurants. I kind of uh, like they're, that. They're getting, the, they're getting taxed yeah. and, and the money that... And, and they're not paying. The customers get taxed. Right. The, the customers, customers get taxed. If you go in for your and, lobster tail... You're gonna pay one percent on your fifty dollars to towards Which, towards what? It says it's homeless for a homeless program. Dade so the County problem is that we don't know necessarily. The thing that always bugs me about this stuff is you don't know exactly how those programs are being run. Like, are the directors pocketing a lot of this money, or is it actually going to feed and clothe the homeless and provide mm -hmm. them a place is to there, sleep? Uh, do they have an out of control homeless population down there? Oh, Miami's I homeless bet they is, do. is some yeah. of the, one of the worst in the nation. But I think it would be a great place to be and, homeless. And, and, and exactly. And there's That's a little bit of a story in this, too. Mm. Miami did under the this Bain tree. because Miami was actually fingered by the federal government saying, what is wrong down there? You guys have the biggest homeless mess mm. in the country. So that made Miami went, okay, here's a good idea. Here's how we'll fix but it. I think it goes to and, like what she was saying. Right, you know, we took pressure, some finger pointing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the finger pointing and the pressure, though, is, is skewed because the weather in Miami, the... The land that's right. in Miami. It's more conducive I think it than Nebraska. It attracts people. I mean, you oh, yeah. right. you're not going to have that in Nebraska, like you just said. Yeah. Right. You're going to have people that are there, but they're like the real homeless. And I'm sure yeah. that there's real homeless there as well. But in Miami, you're going to have like 20 year olds. So it's what, just, what? Exactly. Yeah, it's just like, easier. I'm not paying for rent. I can camp out. So what, exactly. what if they created? What if they created a program where they not even one percent, a half a percent went towards some kind of veterans? Yeah, uh, initiative. Well, see, oh. that should be in every state. See, what Miami's doing, okay, it might work. You know, if it's got, anything's going to have corruption no matter why, mm -hmm. you, you know that. But if they're getting some money into the homeless uh, situation, good. But why don't we, like Mike's saying, why don't we encourage other counties and cities to do a restaurant tax or whatever it is that's going directly and exclusively to homeless veterans? Mm -hmm. There you go. Not the twenty-year-olds who just ran, ran out of Absolutely. daddy's money because spring breaks over in Miami and I can't. Or get somebody home, who got you know. hit by sequestration. Well, you know what they say, right? Yeah. Right. Write your congressman. Write your congressman. And your representatives. There you go. All, All right. right. Well, we got a show to start. I hope are you guys ready to start the show. We are ready. Let's sure. do this. Welcome to Veterans Nation. My name is Mike Dowling, U.S. Marine, Iraqi uh, OIF veteran, and we got Mr. Rydell Danzi. Kelly Smith, Rick Seaman, and Ryan, our audio engineer down, out there in the back. How are you, how are you Ryan? Good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, should we dedicate the show? Let's dedicate. Let's dedicate. We shall. All right, today's segment is dedicated to the Army 2nd Infantry Division. Yeah. Who are? You are Army, right, right now? Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah. First cab. Second calf. 217 and third ID, actually. Did you ever oh, work? your third ID? Oh, third ID, oh, okay. 217 air calf, oh, and uh, 85th medevac, which all right. was after I got hurt. But. That's like 10 yeah. units all in one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Second, second division. Second division. Big, oh, I big, like that. big in Korea. The Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. man, they've been holding that thing down for since, since the end of the Korean War. All right, second yeah. division, yes. Thank second you, division. second division. Uh, Rick? Just wanted to let you know that the poll is closed. Oh, it is. Finally. I know. I know. Oh, I know. the, vi the video game poll. Video game no. poll is closed. Oh, yeah, the video game poll. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. yeah I yep. tried to keep it going, but they wouldn't let me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what are the results? All right. Uh, well, of course, we've got actually a lot of results. Um, a lot of people, thank you so much for voting. And we actually got a lot of comments from voters as well. One of the questions was, as a veteran, do you approve of combat video games for kids? Um, we got almost 600 votes with a mix of 447 veterans and 132 non-veterans. And it looks like the votes were 
Not quite as good as the election, but <laughs> pretty close. We had 54% voted yes, and 46 said no, that veterans do not approve of combat video games for kids. Okay. Mm. So, and? So the majority did approve. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. 54% approved, yep. yeah. But 46, 46 didn't approve. Um, we did get a ton of comments, and uh, I'll just go ahead and read them to oh, you guys. You got some there? Not everybody has them all. Um, oh, okay, so they, here's they, from. Been highlighted. Yeah. Here's yeah. from some people that are the no voters, people that did not think it's appropriate. One of them says, let kids be kids, they'll learn about violence soon enough. Another oh. said, these games make killing fun, that makes no sense to me. And another said, wouldn't games about science or health be more productive? I like that last answer. Yeah. But yeah. we have no we, but, but, no but we but do have sell. games. We do have games that are about science and health. And science and health. And I, reading I and what math. Yeah. What saying. are the names of them? You can't yeah. name one. Yeah, how many That's of them, the point. How many of them <laughs> are on NFL or, or, or baseball commercials, you know, as, yeah. as, as games advertised? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what about, Did we get any comments from yes votes? Okay, so for the people that think it's fine, uh, one of them says, come on now, kids have been playing war games, cowboys and Indians and getting Ooh. in scraps with each other since we had soldiers. Mm. Now it's done electronically, what's the big deal? Like that. Okay. I feel that's like we actually vote. touched on this when we first talked about we putting did. a poll, which I kind of agree with, like it's kind of part of human nature to go to war. Yeah. We're not a peaceful community. We are violent. I was ready to well, go to war with you this morning. Are we glorify. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like that person says, you know, kids have been emulating soldiers right. since we ever had soldiers. And the other thing yeah. is, is like, it's, not, times, it's you know? not necessarily in a bad manner. Like, think about G.I. Joe. They're the heroes. Yeah. You know, the, when you'd play G.I. Joe as little kids. I think I talked about my sisters playing Navy SEAL. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't have the video games, but if we'd had them... I think that it's that's more of the issue is that, like you just said, you didn't have the game, so you had to actually go out and do it. Go out and so play it, it stimulated your mind and imagination as opposed to just sitting there and doing right. it. Right, you're still going to find a way yeah. to, yeah. to, you know, yeah. to entertain I, I, yourself I with totally it. I totally agree with that, and, but I do remember when I was a kid, you know, in the video games, remember when everybody was like, oh, we really should be promoting video games because uh, it's better hand-eye coordination. I remember actually trying to use that against my parents mm -hmm. to make them buy yeah, sure. Atari or whatever it was yeah, at the time. Yeah. And my parents were like, yeah, right. <laughs> and now it's actually true. I mean, look at all the drones yeah. out there. I yeah. mean, this is actually like right. Ender's Game. I mean, it's real. It's, it's actually happened. Yeah. But, okay, I'll get back but, to well, what I'm supposed to be talking about. One more thing, though. Do you, why can't kids... Well, I mean, I think kids should look up to military heroes, mm -hmm. just like they do National Football League, you know, Major League Baseball, boxing, you name it, uh, basketball. They look up to those sports here. Why can't they look up to and emulate well, I, no, think, they can. I think it's, they, they can, it's just that the way can. all the video games are portrayed is very violently versus a basketball game. Yeah. Nobody's getting killed. Okay, so all we right. have another uh, comment from point. a yes voter. It says, these games allow kids to pretend to be warriors. I don't see that as a bad thing, which is essentially what we were just what discussing. We're just saying, yeah. um, another one, and this one I like, kids will play war as long as we have real wars. You want the games to go away? Then simply make the real wars go away. And good luck. <laughs> okay. I second that commenter. Okay. Totally agree with okay. you. I don't know, you know, if they'll play for as long as, uh, as there's wars. I think they're going to play regardless, you know? I mean, growing up, when there wasn't a war going on when I was playing video games. That's a good point. And, like, they have those medieval times. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was playing video games. All kinds of gone. video games uh, younger. But just like, you know, and also the G.I. Joes. And, and it's not just video games. You can argue the whole entertainment industry, the cartoons <laughs> and oh, yeah. uh, yeah. everything that goes along with it. So I, don't, I think this argument shouldn't just be limited just to video games because it's part of the whole overall entertainment industry. Sure, yeah. sure. Anyways. Uh, you got any more? All right. Well, this one was highlighted in a different color so uh, let's see what they said <laughs> if we think we need to teach kids not to see war and killing as entertainment then we should make these games even more realistic when an electronic screen character is blown up his stomach and intestines should spill to the ground on display and the device should emit the smell of death 
such as the smell of blood and the lower digestive tract. Make it realistically repulsive like it really is rather than cute and superficial. I'm a former combat medic. Oh, I appreciate that comment. Uh, and, uh, I see his point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I certainly see the point. He almost sounded like he should have been a no vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know? but, uh, but, I mean, like I said, I see his point, and there's, I don't know if I'm going to go as far as uh, creating that smell. I don't even know how you can create it's, that smell. It's not commercially <laughs> possible. Realistic, no. but... Um, I understand I, his point, though. Yeah, is he well. saying that we're basically, like, the entertainment industry is glorifying... Um, somebody's guts being spilled out of them and yet you know I mean I've seen it in movies I just don't even get moved anymore by a lot of that stuff but it's like mm -hmm. oh it's CG again I still or whatever I take the stance of you know just better education and interaction with the parents or some kind of authority figure with that child not just let that child see that and that's it and have him have his own interpretation of it but have someone in there to to let him know what it what it means and give them a proper understanding of it. Does yeah. that make sense? Well, thank you. So on that note, uh, <laughs> let's take a realistic break, <laughs> shall we? So we'll be back. Throughout the history of this great nation, men and women of courage and valor have sacrificed to provide the security of those they love. George Washington understood the importance of recognizing that courage, and the Purple Heart was born, a symbol of sacrifice and heroism and a tribute to those who have given their all for freedom. For 50 years, the Military Order of the Purple Heart and the Purple Heart Service Foundation have channeled that same heroism and courage into helping all veterans and their families. With a national service program to assist veterans with VA claims assistance, providing grants for disabled veterans, leading the way in research and treatment initiatives for traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress, along with many other forms of assistance to help our men and women in uniform transition to civilian life. The Purple Heart Service Foundation has been there. Tomorrow's challenges are great. The obstacles are many. The threats, real. The men and women who serve today will need our support tomorrow, and we will be there for the next 50 years and beyond. Please join us in helping those who protect our freedom. The next generation of heroes would like to thank you in advance. Okay, we are back, and uh, we're going to be talking with a Mr. Alan Cates, who is a combat helicopter pilot with the U.S. Marines in Vietnam. Following his career with the Marines, Alan moved on and went to fly for Air America while they were performing in Southeast Asia Very cool. during that Vietnam War. And uh, Air America, as many of us know, flew secret missions in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And there's about 400 of these brave pilots still around. And they have an Air America Association. What this association is trying to do currently is to get full veterans status for their service during the war in Southeast Asia. Now, I'd like to note here that almost all personnel who were with Air America were regular military before they went on with Air America, and which, is a, which is a privately owned, government controlled uh, combat fighting team. Here's an interesting thing. Hmm. Our merchant marines, who were civilians, finally after decades, after World War II, they finally were granted veterans status from their uh, merchant marine days in World War II. So there was a precedent. Brian, we got him? Yep. We got you on? You know? Mr. Cates, are you there, sir? Yes, sir, I am, Rick, and I really appreciate you having me on your show. Thank you very much. Alan, uh, having heard my intro or and our intro discussion here, can you add for all of our veteran viewers out there, uh, just tell us, tell us the story. Let's hear it. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, veteran status has been uh, i uh, been working on that for several years for the Air America employees, and it's not just the pilots. It also is the other members of the flight crew, flight mechanics and uh, uh, air freight specialists uh, we commonly call kickers. Also the maintenance personnel and the uh, uh, operations personnel and flight information personnel, which you have to have in order to have an operation uh, uh, be successful. 
Uh, Air America was, uh, was a government-owned uh, company that was held secret because they wanted to be able to uh, do old board acts covertly where they could not do this uh, in uh, certain areas with the active military because of public uh, pressure and treaty restraints with the Geneva Accords and et cetera. And so Air America was a, uh, a, a viable uh, company that could be used to do this because it made them look like they were a civilian organization uh, uh, enterprise that uh, was there for hire when in fact uh, they really actually were owned by the U.S. government. But unfortunately, this secrecy uh, prevented the uh, uh, U.S. government from giving the normal benefits that you give to uh, uh, government personnel. And so Air America actually, after uh, several years of, of conducting this type of business, which was actually exact military plant, military aircraft, they end up uh, getting uh, just saying, hey, goodbye, and turn you loose. And, and some of the people who uh, could have used uh, some of the uh, long-term uh, uh, benefits obtained from uh, disability, and uh, those were wounded in action, uh, uh, recognition for those people who were killed in action. And, and, and for the most part, though, it's just, uh, it was just a kind of a feel-good situation to say that we were something more than what the movie spoofs have uh, characterized us as. And I think that everybody would feel good about it. I certainly would. I'd like to be able to tell my children's children that we were something more than what uh, the Mel Gibson, the uh, a Morton Downey type of uh, operation that uh, was uh, that the movie and some of the people have said about us. Hey, Mr. Kitts, Mike Dowling here. Has Air America made any official approaches to Congress uh, at, at at any point in regards to this? Well, everybody has, of course. So you you can't you have to go through your the congressman and pre, you know that takes care of the constituents of your state. And and there's an Air America employee in practically every state of the union. And so we have, in fact, gone to Congress. But, but Congress is limited in what they can do. Uh, now, Congress did pass a law in 1995 that allowed certain civilian organizations that, that had worked with the military to obtain veteran status, and that's how the Merchant Marines got it, and a couple of the other organizations. And that is the law that we're using to uh, get veteran status. They assigned this to the Secretary of the Air Force, who put up a board called Civilian Military Service Review Board. And that board does not really... Listen to Congress. I mean, they, they they will take the application. They have strict guidelines that they go by, and you they want you to meet those guidelines. The past president is not one of the things that they pay attention to. One that I don't agree with, by the way. But that's uh, we you, we have to show uh, that we actually were under the uh, jurisdiction of the U.S. military while we were operating, and that was difficult because much of this work was secret. Uh, but I think that we've satisfactorily uh, done that, especially with a certain documentation that has uh, come out uh, just recently and allowed us to uh, make a reconsideration after originally being turned down. I think we've got a good chance. I just got a telephone call from General Richard Secord, who was very much involved with Air America, and he said that he certainly is going to issue an affidavit in this regard and uh, can show that uh, he was the one who, who ordered Air America to do some of the operations that was in, that we were involved with in Laos. So that's a good sign, and I think other military people have come forward and are going to do this as well. Alan, Rick here again. So it sounds like you guys have a decent shot at, at getting uh, recognized. What, uh, what I'd like to do here at, at Veterans Network is put this question up on our veterans voting poll as a new question beginning right now. Uh, and these poll results are always submitted to the U.S. House Committee on Veterans Affairs. And then I can also submit the results to the board that you mentioned so we can hit, hit it on both sides. Does that sound good to you? Yes, it does. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it comes out. You know, those, the, the, so it was very surprising to me uh, when I, I wrote a book about this. Actually, I, I really was... The idea was to publish the research that I did about Air America and even learn some things myself uh, while I was doing it. And, uh, and I ended up, uh, was told that I need to personalize it in order to get this thing to fly, and uh, that was accomplished. But it was interesting to me to see the, the military people who knew about Air America, who were personally involved with them, how much they applauded our, our efforts. Now, the ones that did, did 
did not come in contact with us, and there were many. They would see us flying around, didn't have no idea who we were or what we were doing. They're probably going to be ambivalent, and I can understand that because secrecy means secrets, and uh, if it's secret, then they're not going to tell everybody about who we really were. And so a lot of people thought we were just uh, mercenaries, as, and then the government, you know, uh, propagated that, and uh, they felt like that, uh, you know, they wanted to keep that information that way. And it hurt, it hurt our effort because uh, the, the government is not inclined to change their way of thinking uh, in that regard. So, I, uh, sure, the, the, the people, you know, we've had uh, the people that we rescued uh, that later became admirals, some of them, and, uh, the, and the people who were actually involved with our operations, who knew where we were, they are completely on our side. I've never heard anybody that wasn't. The ones that didn't know anything about us, they're probably, like I said, they're going to be ambivalent, you know. Well, hey, tell all your buddies and comrades that we appreciate and salute their gallant service in that war and that we're with you guys all the way. Well, you know how it is. If the government says it, then it's true, and if they don't say it, it's not true. Even though it may, you know, someone else may say it, the government itself has to actually say it. So right. you know how that goes. I know. Well, listen, Alan, thank you, uh, thank you for your time, and uh, good luck. I really appreciate the effort, and it's people like you that will help us get what we need to have done. And I, I, I think everybody appreciates that, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity for us to present ourselves. All right. Air America. All right. Well, that was Hurrah. perfect timing because, as they say, one door closes and another opens. At Veterans Nation, one pull closes and another opens. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this important phone call about folks at Air America. And please respond to our polls. See you next time.